committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Care Court Grants Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. All Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and Committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. Zoom captioning is available. To enable this, select Live Transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then select Enable Auto Transcription. Okay, Eric, those are the housekeeping remarks. Okay, thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to today's meeting. Uh, let me start by asking if there are any members of the public who wish to comment. Okay. No. Yes, any? No hands, no. Okay, great. So then uh, let's move on, and I guess we'll take a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Blakemore? Present. Uh, Commissioner Escobedo? Absent. Uh, Commissioner Morales? Here. Hi, Maria. Commissioner Campbell? Present. Hi, Vanetta. Judge Klein? I see you. We can't hear you, but I do see you, Judge Klein. Oh, I, I said here. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Now we can hear you. Right. Uh, Commissioner Pryor? Here. Uh, and Commissioner Iskin? Here. Uh, we do have quorum. Okay. Uh, and I'll do um, uh, liaisons if that's okay really quickly. Sure. Uh, Selena Copeland from LAC? I see Lauren, though. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Uh, Laura Brown from the Judicial Council. Here. Melanie Snyder from the Judicial Council. Here. Hi, Melanie. Hi. And then for State Bar staff, um, uh, Dwan Wynn uh, is listening, but not a, a panelist. Uh, Chris McConkie is here. Brady Dewar. <clears throat> Helen Yu, I see, is here. Shannon is here. And... Kim Wormsley. Okay, thank you, Eric. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, moving on to item three, are there any comments about the minutes for the March 14th meeting of this committee? Catherine Moose approval. I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Blake Moore moves. Uh, Commissioner Iskin seconds. Uh, taking the vote, uh, Commissioner Blake Moore? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Campbell? Yes. Commissioner Scobedo? He's absent. Uh, Commissioner Morales? Here. Yes. Judge Klein? Here. And is that a vote for yes for the uh, approving the minutes, Judge Klein? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pryor? Yes. Uh, and Commissioner Iskin? Yes. Uh, that is um, six uh, ayes, no nays, no abstentions. Uh, so motion passes. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. So the main item of business, actually the only item of business that we have today is to approve the RFP for this year's uh, uh, care courts uh, solicitations. But before we get to that, and based upon some discussion at the last meeting, we have invited some representatives um, of various counties who have actually had on the ground experience with the care courts program in its first few months of operation to come here and um, and uh, make some comments and then be available for questions to give this committee. And this is just an information gathering uh, exercise for us, um, you know, just a sense for how this court is working and what the challenges are. So I really appreciate um, those of you who uh, who are here. And why don't I, Helen, why don't you uh, introduce our guests, if you could? Sure. Uh, I will share my screen really quick. Okay. 
Okay. Let me know if you all can see my screen. I can. Perfect. Great. Um, as Eric mentioned, welcome and thank you all for your participation today. Before we begin the roundtable discussion and Q&A with our guest speakers and commissioners, um, I'd like to provide a bit of background information to help frame the agenda item. The Care Court Grants Committee is a subgroup of the State Bar's Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. The committee is tasked with approving the request for proposals for grantees and evaluating applications to re recommend to the commission. Today, our guest speakers will share their experience implementing Care Court, including their top two to three successes and challenges during the roundtable portion, and be available to answer any questions the committee may have regarding the realities of implementation. With that, I'd like to introduce introduce our guest speakers. Um, I'll start introductions in alph alphabetical order by last name, and we can pl plan to follow the same order with the roundtable share out. Um, we have Judge Michael Biegert, Supervising Judge, Superior Court of California, County of San Francisco, Jennifer Bender, Supervising Deputy Public Defender from the Law Offices of the Public Defender, County of Riverside, Devin Fahi, Supervising Attorney, Care Court, from Justice and Diversity Center of the Bar Association of San Francisco, Jennifer Jennison, Public Defender from the Stanislaus County Public Defender's Office, and Caitlin Wilson, Care Court Coordinating Attorney from the Legal Assistance to the Elderly. We can now start with our roundtable share out. Um, each invitee will have about five minutes to share their experience implementing Care Court. Um, I'll be keeping track of time just to make sure that we stay on schedule. So my apologies in advance um, if I interrupt any of our guest speakers at any point. Yeah, and our thought is that after the uh, panelists make some introductory comments that we'll open it up for questions and we'll target to do this for uh, at most maybe an hour, hour and 15, because we do need to, to save some time to talk about the uh, proposed RFP. All right, um, let's proceed. Thank you. Again, thanks to those of you who, who came. Really appreciate it. Uh, I guess if we're going in alphabetical order, I'll start. So uh, good morning. I'm Michael Baggert. I'm the uh, judge who is running the care court in San Francisco, and I've been involved in the uh, cohort one implementation process uh, since late 2022. So um, what we were anticipating uh, while we were building these programs in the cohort one counties was uh, the possibility of a huge influx of uh, folks who qualified for and needed the services of the care court. Uh, as I'm sure you've all seen, that has not materialized. So all of the counties have uh, had pretty consistent experiences, and the numbers are below what uh, everyone, I think, uh, I won't say anticipated because I don't think we had enough information to actually predict what was going to happen, but it was, uh, it's been, I, I would say, on the low end of um, what we considered to be possible. The successes uh, have been in instances where Folks were identified uh, who were not known to the Department of Public Health. Uh, sometimes if someone happened to be in crisis and a family member identified them uh, and there was an intervention. Uh, so the first step in the care court process when a petition is filed by someone other than public health is that the court orders a report uh, to be prepared by the Department of Public Health. So they'd go out and talk to the person uh, affected and uh, try to engage them voluntarily. And where that is successful, uh, the petition stops there and hopefully the person is um, accessing services that they need. That has not happened. Um, well, we've only had 22 cases in San Francisco, which is a county of 850,000 uh, people plus. Uh, so that hasn't happened in a large percentage of the cases, but those, I think everyone would agree are successes. Uh, the challenges have been engagement, uh, which I think, uh, if I'd had the foresight to think about this, that would have been predictable because of the definition of who qualifies for the program. Basically, we are, uh, addressing 
people who are both severely mentally ill and uh, who have not voluntarily engaged with uh, services. So that is going to be a difficult population to access when you're talking about um, folks who are psychotic, uh, because part of the disease is that you uh, don't recognize, you don't have insight into the fact that um, you are not well and that you are not necessarily need help for your mental health. So um, that has been a challenge. We have identified folks um, who definitely need and deserve support. Uh, it's been difficult to have them engaged in accepting that support. And I think that is closely related to the other challenge that I would identify, which is that this is a housing first model, but I don't think we had a shared, um, I don't think we, the in the largest sense, uh, we, the community, the society has a shared understanding of what housing first would be um, would look like or be effective for people in this population. So if you have uh, a person who is uh, psychotic, uh, they are not going to be appropriate for um, immediately placing them in independent housing without supports in the general community. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the kind of supports that we have, the kind of housing that we have available for people who are um, currently actively psychotic uh, is not very attractive to the people we're trying to reach. So um, they are not necessarily interested in engaging with the services that they know are available from their history uh, with the public health system. So that's been a challenge. Uh, I think we can imagine services uh, that would be attractive to folks and would solve the engagement problem. Uh, I don't think we are willing or able to provide that level of service uh, to folks who do not have the means to pay for them by themselves. So um, that is an ongoing challenge. Well, thank you, Judge. Very interesting. Um, there were some questions for you. Why don't, why don't we proceed to the next? Are you, are you finished? I'm sorry, I don't mean yes. to cut. Yeah. yeah, I think I went too long, so I'm done. <laughs> hey, thank you, um, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for listening to us today. I'm just gonna jump right in and give you kind of a list of some of the um, challenges that we've faced and the solutions that we've come up with to meet them. Um, one of the things that the CARE Act doesn't really address is clients who have outstanding criminal cases. And that is a big issue because most people do have some form um, of a criminal case. For serious cases, we haven't really been able to do much uh, for them because our district attorney's office you know, is reluctant to agree to some sort of outpatient treatment in lieu of um, custody time for a serious case, um, especially um, when uh, the CARE Act calls for confidentiality and uh, we have to get our clients on board with sharing that in order to help resolve their cases. So for those cases uh, where the client is willing to share their information to help with the resolution, we created a a release of information specific for care. And um, we've been able to successfully do that for cases where the client has outstanding violations of probation terms. Um, the judges have been receptive to staying those terms as long as the, part, the person's participating in care court, um, or we uh, are able to work with uh, our other attorneys to do mental health diversion motions under 1,136 or judicial diversion under 1,195. Um, another challenge that we've had is we have um, a care client who our representation would be a conflict of interest. And we weren't really sure what to do about that um, because being the only entity in Riverside County that was approved to represent care respondents, we had to quickly pivot to figure out someone else that could do that. And then with the reporting requirements, um, 
we are the reporter for Riverside County. So if we are handing a case off to someone else, we are going to be uh, giving them the funding under the state bar guidelines, but then we need to get the information from them so we can include it in our quarterly reporting. So that was um, a challenge that we met and we created a, a conflict reporting form that basically took everything from the reporting that's required under the quarter and we put it into charts to make it easy for the conflict attorney to be able to provide that information to us. And I'd be happy to share that with, um, I can send it to Helen later. Um, we also, um, everyone is experiencing the same problem of being appointed counsel to someone who we can't find. Mm -hmm. So um, we are trying to um, access our county's HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System database, but as of right now, we have not been given access to that. We're hopeful that we're going to be given access to it, but they haven't granted us permission yet. We had a meeting um, this past Friday, and hopefully any fears that they have of giving the Public Defender's Office uh, access to that will be alleviated, but stay tuned. Um, we also came up with the unique idea of having a dedicated cell phone just for care clients because um, our clients sometimes have access to phones, but they don't necessarily pick them up, but we can text them um, and they're more comfortable in replying to a text message than they are picking up the phone or actually making a phone call. Um, and so that's been successful. And um, we always have that phone in the hands of a social worker in my office. So Anytime a, a text comes in, we're able to respond and say, hey, thanks for getting in touch. What do you need? You know, how can we help you? And then we also had business cards printed with that cell phone. So when we are meeting with a respondent or a client, we are not handing them a bunch of cards from a bunch of us, you know, a social service provider and an attorney, because they're, they're meeting so many people at once as part of this process that it's um, confusing to them. So we just give them one card. That's the card we write the next court date on. That's the card we say, we, you know, we write our names on the card, but it's just one phone number. And there's an email to a dedicated email if they want. We had had a couple clients who just want, who don't want to talk on the phone, but are willing to communicate by email. Um, feel free to cut me off. I have more, <laughs> but um, I haven't been watching the time. Um, no worries. We uh, can do like 30, last one more. <laughs> okay. So um, we uh, we have problems with clients who have uh, no social security benefits or their benefits have lapsed. And um, historically, behavioral health has taken care of that for us, but we've found that um, it's not really happening in the timeline we would like. So um, the social service, social worker providers that we've hired as part of our care team are becoming what's called SOAR certified and that assists them in doing the applications for our clients specifically. Um, and that way that's in our hands and we can make sure that that's happening for our clients um, as fast as possible. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. I don't wanna make this too much like an oral argument, like that's it, counselor, you're done. <laughs> I have two more, but there's, there's plenty of time later, so. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Devin? Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, I just want to echo, we're also finding it difficult to find our folks. Um, most of them aren't housed. Um, even though folks that are housed, um, like Judge Beggert said, um, there are pretty high needs when it comes to mental disability. And so just getting folks to engage, um, even understand who we are or what the process is, is pretty trying. Um, we have found that it's easier whenever we have family members who are involved. It definitely takes a community. Um, and especially when the family member is the original petitioner, it's just easier to kind of reach these folks. Um, as far as our successes, um, at HAP, we've been able to reach two different care agreements for two of our clients. Um, and it has some good stuff in there that I think can really help these folks. And because we are a legal aid, we're in the unique position too that we can offer wraparound services. Um, so for instance, in one of our cases, we've been able to do eviction defense. In another one, we've been able to offer immigration and benefits services. Um, so we can totally just help these folks out where we're meeting them. Um, like Judge Beggert said, I think we're um, maybe a little surprised too at the number that we're seeing. Um, it's maybe not as high as we anticipated. 
that did give us some time to fully staff up, um, which we're at now, and we are ready and roaring to take on cases. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing on our end here at Hub. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Devin. Um, Jennifer? Jennison. Hi. Okay, so I have a list. <laughs> um, I'm the Stanislaus County Public Defender, but due to some of our challenges, I'm also the person that handles care court every Monday. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest challenge for us was learning at a very late date that we would be providing representation. We had um, a QLSP in the mix who even submitted an application and after submitting it, withdrew it. Um, and they also thought that they were going to be providing only a certain percentage. So we, I have been attending these meetings for, I mean, over a year, the, the entire time, um, because our county wanted the public defender's office to provide representation and they believe in, in you know, the work we do, but it wasn't a certainty and there was no money to fund extra positions. So we waited till the very last minute and only very recently were we able to recruit a care court attorney other than myself. So if the offices could know sooner, um, it just creates lots of problems in the public defender's office with hiring staff. Um, we also could have benefited from some clearer guidelines on how to use the funding when it has to be spent um, that sort of thing. Uh, collecting data is a challenge for the public defender's office because that's just not something that we're used to doing. Um, practically, we don't have a case management system that is set up in, in a lot of ways that the other counties are. We are moving into that, but we're looking at not having that until October. So we created a form and we're collecting the information as best we can, but it's also not something that public defender's offices collect at all. So it's very strange. Sometimes my client will be sitting next to me in court and, you know, they're not well. These are very sick individuals. And I'm, you know, asking, try, I'm supposed to ask, are you a veteran? Um, you know, are, all of these very personal questions and it really just isn't the proper setting for it. So I just have some concerns about the public defender collecting that data and how accurate it really is. I think the behavioral health department is probably better for that. Um, the, something that we never anticipated in all of our meetings was the individuals who would want to file their own care court petitions. So we went to all of these meetings and I don't ever remember anybody anticipating that. And it wasn't until we did some report backs in San Diego County was like helping their clients in jail filing these care court petitions. Because I think the public defender's office was like, whoa, you know, you're going to take our clients rights away and we don't want to participate in that. But it turns out it, it's a really good thing. And there are a lot of services available, but nobody anticipated that. So we don't have a good mechanism in place still to assist our clients with filing petitions. I think other counties would benefit from that. Um, we're in a very strange position when we have family members who reach out to the public defender's office for help, but the client maybe doesn't want help. And it puts us in a horrible position because we represent the clients. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing. You know, we feel awful for the family. We want to help them. We want to answer their questions, but we don't really have a good place to send them. Um, we also, like I think Jen said, we have HMIS issues. We've asked for this database before to help locate our clients locally. And we were told, no, you can't have it because the next step is the DA is going to want it. Um, that would be a game changer for us if we could have access to that. Um, we have a lot of individuals who don't want to engage with BHRS. A lot of them are in criminal court. BHRS either can't get them to the cell or they don't, they're not willing to go to the cell. But it turns out that our client support staff, our social workers, our case navigators can access these individuals because we have this relationship and trust with them. But we don't really have the manpower. So if we're going to be the ones doing all of that, we probably need you know, an additional position, an additional social worker or a client support specialist just for care court. Um, and I think one of the struggles for everyone is acknowledging that this model when you're in court every, every time care court happens needs to be different than traditional court. It seemed like we were trying that in the very beginning and now it's sort of just fallen into, okay, Mr. So-and-so, your next court date is this, the findings are this. I think it would be very productive and helpful if we could remember that we're trying something different here, 
Um, and just having something less formal than a regular court process. It, I have some successes, believe it or not. Helen, do I have time? <laughs> Uh, we have about a minute left. Okay. One of the biggest benefits of Care Court in our county has been uh, bridging gaps in services. So even for the individuals who don't ever get accepted into Care Court, it has caused our local agencies to have communications and conversations that have never happened before. So it's been amazing in that way. Um, and then I think Jen also mentioned almost a lot of people have criminal cases pending, but we have been very successful, thankfully. The DA's office is cooperative and, and they're buying into the care court process. So they are very willing to work with us um, on those criminal cases to get people into care court. That, that's a positive. The, the hard thing is the criminal court and the care courts do not communicate at all with each other. So, you know, I'm trying to re recall warrants and putting those cases on calendar in the criminal courts, negotiating with the DA's to try to get an outcome in that case separate from care court. So it would be very helpful if there was some sort of mechanism for the two to at least communicate with each other. Yeah. Now I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Caitlin? Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, <clears throat> having us. So I am the coordinating attorney for legal assistance to the elderly, one of the QLSPs in San Francisco. Um, I think my comments are a little bit different than everyone else's, um, but I think that's what makes Care Court Care Court. So our, one of our successes is that we have been able to locate um, all but one of our clients. Um, one of the unique positions that we're in with a housing background is already having those connections in the unhoused community um, and being able to to utilize our sort of insider knowledge that we have about um, how the unhoused live and, and where they hang out and who they who they trust. Um, has been really helpful for us and just being able to put in the time and just pound the pavement and go out there and, and find people and create even more connections. Um, we've also found a success in creating relationships for clients with outside sources like the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. Um, and we've seen, I think our biggest client based successes being when they can connect with someone with lived experience um, and how, how much that, that can really change their perspective on this whole system because most of our clients have had previous experience with the court system and, and those experiences have not been helpful. Um, and so being able to see that this is different or we're hoping that it's different um, and connecting people with non-lawyers, with, with other organizations who um, can maybe try to re help clients reframe this. We have had significant challenges. Um, just a logistical challenge would be transportation and, and having clients appear. We think it's really important that clients do participate in this process and that they have the ability to go to court and meet everyone. Um, but we are only a team of three to four. Um, and so if we've got three cases on calendar, we need to have one attorney in court and someone else finding them and bringing them. And how does that work? Um, we've had to appear <clears throat> remotely from hospital rooms, from the streets, from libraries, um, and that's been a challenge of just, like others have said, staffing-wise, how do we logistically make this work? And then, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest challenge that we have has been uh, navigating how SB 43 and the changes in conservatorship laws um, interact with care court. Um, and whether or not they should interact. If so, how do they interact? Um, because it can, in our experience, kind of make us question or make us have to reevaluate our ethical obligations to our clients when information that's being used in care court is being you know, used in another purpose um, for another case for a higher level of care that could potentially restrict our clients' rights. Um, and subsequent to that, that's made, um, care court, at least for us, a lot more litigious. And we're spending a lot more time now at the desk doing research, writing briefs um, and other motions that we were not anticipating in a collaborative model. Uh, not that we thought there would, wouldn't be any litigation, but um, due to the influences that SB 43 has had on our cases, it's now made this a bit more of a court sort of thing. And as, as my other colleagues have said, um, we. We don't want it to be that way, um, but if SB 43 is going to 
at all impact the care court process, that's unfortunately something that's just going to have to be the nature of the game that we're playing. So, thank, thank you. you. Can I, um, Helen? Was that? I think with Caitlin was our last guest speaker to do Nature, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to jump in and and um, kind of echo something I heard from um, Jennifer in Stanislaus County, which was two of the challenges she described are challenges we hear about a lot, just to say that like, I think almost every public defender office has probably voiced at least two of these things to us um, so far. And so one is sort of the timing of the um, learning, if it's gonna be a QLSP or a public defender office or both, as is the case in San Francisco, that might be representing respondents in like the upcoming fiscal year. The timing is really challenging for statutorily so, I think, um, for the public defender's offices. So to name that, I think that's probably across the board. So for example, this year, you know, the commission is going to be unable to make or at least confirm awards until after the Budget Act of 2024 passes, which will probably be in mid to late June. Or it could be earlier, but probably will be mid to late June. But for like Stanislaus County, but also LA and San Francisco, like the state fiscal year turns over on July 1, like they get new, a new pot of funding for that. Like, so that that sort of like statutory challenge is, um, I think, probably a pain point for all the public defender offices. Um, um, one workaround like would be something like multi-year, uh, to the extent that QLSP and public defender offices might continue to share the space in some counties, like multi-year funding uh, to at least like reduce that pain point, make it not an annual thing. Uh, and that's something we've, we've started to look into if something like that might be possible. Um, and then the other thing that Jennifer described, I think um, we've heard from several public defender offices and and, um, and to some extent maybe the two QSPs as well is for the reporting requirements. As a reminder, the Budget Act of 2023 uh, used the language that the commission should collect data that's consistent and comparable for these funds that it collects for other funds. So that's why we included questions like veteran, like what's your veteran status and, and gender identity and that kind of thing, race, ethnicity. But to the extent that like Jennifer and Jen Bender and, and our two QLIS piece who are here can say like, you know what, actually that's really challenging to collect from this population. That is the sort of thing where the committee might have some wiggle room to decide how it interprets consistent and comparable. Uh, and if a particular date, so for example, like the commission for other grants collects um, uh, disability status differently. It collects it as just like yes, no, unknown. But for care court, we ask for a little more information because it's kind of assumed that most respondents would, the answer would be yes, if that was the only three options. So that's just to say like how you interpret consistent and comparable is actually have some flexibility there. So if you have questions for Jennifer, Jen, the two QSPs, if you have ideas of how the reporting requirements could make more sense, this committee actually sets those, so or and, and you know exercising its authority um, that's been delegated to it by the commission. So, does anyone want to respond to what Chris just said? Well, I have a question. Um, sometimes the uh, data is is unusual, unnecessarily long and detailed. Uh, is there a reason we ask are they veterans? Is there some funding reason? I mean, are all these questions relevant? Perhaps the form, because I understand the problems could be much more simple. And, and ask for truly relevant points. I don't have the form in front of me, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just guessing. But we've all seen enough of those ridiculously long questions, questionnaires. Yeah, the current reporting requirements are mostly the, like the, the, the different categories of different demographics and the like um, are mostly from the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook that the commission uses for all of its grants. So can you maybe For, share on the screen? Like, I, it seems this seems like a very abstract thing if we want to get into it. And I'm also just fine to do it generally. But I, I, like, I, I'm not quite, it seems like we're kind of going ahead to like the, what should be required with the grant, not just understanding the care board. So whichever yeah. way you want to do it, but I can't really, I can't really think about changes without recalling what yeah. they are. Are, are we, uh, is this open for questions? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, it is. Let, let's try to direct some questions to the- All right, um, the panelists, uh, I, I, I don't know them, but I, I was an LA County judge and I worked in the LPS court on and off for three years and also a juvenile um, collaborative court. So I have some familiarity. I have some questions 
for um, the San Francisco, well, actually for everybody, um, but uh, how similar, uh, for those of you who worked LPS courts, are, are the proceedings in reality? Because you mentioned psychotics who have you know no understanding that, uh, of what the problem is, and that was a classic case, of course, we had in, in LPS court. Uh, are the proceedings somewhat similar? Are people being transferred because they're not complying with it? And so the health people are, are looking for the next step, which is the LPS courts. Um, are, are they, you know, sort of working together at all? So I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that yeah. to begin with. We, we might be on one extreme end of this in terms of how the court looks. So the way this court looks when you walk into it, everybody is seated at a big conference table. Um, there, if there are uh, folks who have some reason for being involved and they're not speaking, they, they might be sitting off uh, in the jury box. It, it is happening in a courtroom. I'm not wearing a robe. I'm sitting at a conference table right next to uh, the respondent, and we're having a conversation. Um, at this point, this only started in uh, at the beginning of October. So in, I would say, all of these cases, we're still in the process of building a relationship with the participant. Uh, this is a voluntary process, so uh, it's not set up in um, a way that emphasizes the hierarchy or em emphasizes the coercive nature of things. And we are trying, I mean, as Ms. Willison pointed out, we not always successfully to keep this separate from the LPS process. The, the legislative intent of this was, uh, among other things, to prevent people from being conserved. So to get people to um, engage in services so that it was not necessary yeah, I, uh, take away their... I, uh, I understand decision. that. But in, in someone who, like you say, psychotic, has no understanding, there's anything wrong with them, they're in the streets, you know, all the horror stories, <clears throat> is there, a, I, I guess there's a reality check, maybe that would be appropriate then for, for an LPS court. Um, but it sounds to me from what you're saying that you're keeping them somewhat distinct. Uh, they're at this point, they're, they're very distinct with the exception that public health is still going to be communicating with the conservator and that's been that that's where the tension has arisen is that the that public health talks to the respondent in a care court case decides that they're gravely disabled and then um, uh, communicates that to the conservator and and a uh, conservatorship proceeding is instituted in the probate court. I'm not communicating with the probate court at all yeah. about that. When I was in the delinquency mental health court, it was a voluntary program. We still had a courtroom. Our procedures were somewhat more informal. And we had a nationally renowned psychiatrist. He was head of UCLA NPI at the time. And he actually thought some of that courtroom setting was productive, um, even though the, the program was compulsory. And as a matter of fact, I don't think we ever had anyone who rejected the opportunity to participate in the program because the public defender, she was excellent, would tell them, I'm here to help you uh, so you're never here in a courtroom again and made it by her own a dialogue a, a positive experience. And, uh, and it obviously was an informal setting, but he thought it was good that there still was a, a courtroom. I'm just throwing that out. Is... Um, one of my proudest moments in, in uh, dealing with mental health patient is uh, I, I did regular cases where they came in and I'm up there in a row. But a lot of these people, um, it's always been a negative experience. And when I said, you know, you're done with your probation program, uh, good luck to you. He said, no, I like coming to court. And it occurred to me that the idea of an authority figure, and I guess we're downplaying that, wearing a robe instead of being, you know, the teacher, the cop, whatever, who's always scolding him, was praising him. Actually, it was very meaningful to him. I'm, I'm just throwing that out, that the idea that a more of a courtroom proceeding uh, isn't productive. I, I'm not sure about that, because um, 
And, and I, another question for you, Judge Bogart. Hey, Cliff, is, let me, let me, uh, can I yeah. just catch up a little bit? Because we have some other folks that want to oh, right. question. So Catherine, why don't you jump in? Thanks so much. The presentations were really informative and I appreciate all of you making time. Um, before I was on the commission, I was uh, the director of Disability Rights California and our pro one of our programs served individuals with mental health disabilities. So I'm, I'm equally passionate about this, but um, I, I think Kate, you raised a really interesting question about the intersection of SB uh, 43 and um, and Care Court. And I, I'm not sure everyone here understands what SB 43 is or what that intersection is. Um, so maybe you could just educate us a little bit bit more about that and the and the kinds of of issues that's presenting um, for you. Sure, I'll do my best and Judge Beggart, if I miss anything, feel free to jump in. Um, so SB 43 has changed the standard for conservatorship laws um, and also made the admissibility of evidence in those cases um, much easier. And um, I think with the intent to um, see more conservatorships and, and that sort of with something that Judge Beggart had been saying, if the legislative intent for care court is to reduce them, then how do these two things um, interact? And so the, the main challenge that we've seen has been in cases where the Department of Public Health has been the original petitioner. Um, and a lot of those cases were filed in October um, in the first round before SB 43 went into effect. Um, and so the challenge that we're having is, is in line also with something that um, Judge Klein was talking about in that we've been telling folks this is voluntary. We've been telling folks we're proud of them. We've been telling folks they're doing great work. Um, but if the Department of Public Health is going to um, monitor these people in care court and then use um, things that they have done or not done um, as evidence for a conservatorship, it has really kind of muddied the waters for us and how we proceed. And so um, it's it's made me have to reevaluate what my duty of loyalty is to my client in regards to how much information I'm sharing and what information I'm sharing and who I'm encouraging my client to speak with um, because I can't guarantee them that everything they do won't be held against them. Um, and the nature of the disability of the folks that we're serving is that they're not going to be able to show up 100% of the time at 100% of everything. And if the Department of Public Health is going to take something where someone doesn't show up 100% in a care court process and then use that in a process where there's um, a deprivation of our client's liberty, that's really hard to... Um, made us have to rethink how how we navigate this process. You know, that's very unfortunate. There was a, I don't mean to dominate this, there was a New York Times article I saved many years ago when I spoke on the courts and talked about how you evaluate progress. And if someone's showing up 80% of the time, you look at that as a positive result rather than, oh, they didn't show up 20% of the time because mental health is a process where people have good and bad days. Same with criminal convictions. Are they holding a job longer? Uh, less, uh, you know, situations of domestic violence. Um, I think people really have to look at uh, how we evaluate success. Can I, can I ask, Judge? Uh, I mean, very good point, as well as in what you're saying. It is. Yeah, why do you, you started off by saying that the, and, every, and you're saying everybody's experiencing that the, the case count or the participation is lower than expected. Um, why, why is that? Why do you think that is? I'll, I'll I'll hear from other folks. So um, we have been appointed on, I believe, 42 cases here in Riverside County, and we have um, eight respondents uh, currently under care agreements. I think that, um, you know, no one really knew what the numbers were going to be. Um, uh, I think we were a little surprised that um, our behavioral health department has not been the initial petitioner on a lot of these. The majority have been 
family members. Um, in one case, um, an original petitioner, he petitioned for himself as part of his reentry um, plan from a criminal case where he was successful in getting resentenced. Um, I just the other thing I'd like to add, though, is that I think that most of the petitioners, whether they're family members or loved ones, have this expectation that care court is a conservatorship. That's the kind of control that they're looking for. They want forced medications. They want involuntary treatment. They want their loved one to be forced to receive the treatment. And they're very upset when they find out that that's not, that's not what we do in care court. And it is very much voluntary, but uh, we do ours in a formal setting um, in hopes of having that black robe effect. Uh, we have a wonderful judge who's very compassionate and engaging with our clients. And that may be part of the reason that we have been able to have so many people agree to participate, but really everyone recognizes that their lack of participation is not going to lead to any consequences other than, of course, later, um, you know, LPS perhaps. Um, but it is the same population in, in answer to someone's question earlier that we deal with. And I've been doing LPS here for 11 years. So, you know, we part of our conversation is, is we want to make sure that you never have an involuntary hospitalization again. So if you're participating here, then, you know, we won't see you later on in that other court or over here in our criminal court. We don't want to see you in those courts. We want to see you happy, healthy, and thriving. And so we're doing our best to make that happen for them. I just wanted to follow up on your numbers. You said you had 42 cases and eight are under agreements. And just in broad strokes, what about the other 34? I mean, I mean, obviously, I don't want you to go through all of them, but I mean, are, are they dismissed? Are they proceeding? I mean, what, you know? We've had a few dismissed uh, for not able to meet criteria or um, petitioner didn't show or things like that. Um, some of the other numbers are like um, still at initial hearing stage. So we're still trying to engage with them and just giving them time to consider accepting services, things like that. And then some are new appointments that we haven't, um, an initial hearing hasn't been set yet our court tends to um, appoint us as soon as possible to give us time to try to find and engage as well as just behavioral health, so. I have a question for Judge Bagart. Um, someone mentioned that the uh, particular judge in Nair County was handling it more like, you know, felony arraignments or something. I is judicial education, whether it be the Judges Association or CJUR, do you have your own network of talking about what works and what doesn't? Uh, well, the cohort one counties have been meeting regularly on that. I'm actually, I was actually selected because I run uh, three different collaborative courts, treatment courts. So yeah. I come from that background anyway. Um, I think most of the counties are running this out of their probate departments. And uh, for example, Orange County is really operating it more as an extension of their uh, Laura's Law AOT um, mm -hmm. program. So I think most of the people have a pretty, most of the people, at least in cohort one, uh, I feel like have a pretty good uh, understanding of um, motivational interviewing and, you know, how to work with folks who have these kinds of challenges. Um, uh, you do have the problem, uh, I think, in all the, well, not in all the courts, but in a lot of the courts of turnover because we get our assignments changed. So yeah. uh, you might have somebody who knows the process really well. I know this happened in Stanislaus County. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then they get a do new assignment. So it, that's going to be a challenge from the judicial perspective. Yeah, I have right. a question. De yeah, Devin so raised a question. Just, sorry. Yeah, well, was, let's, let's just kind of round it up. Well, you can go after Catherine, okay. Okay, I, I was just gonna, one of the things I was um, interested in is the description of, because th this is something I think is a bit in our control um, when, when we distribute the money is sort of the types of services you need to provide and the types of staff you need to employ. And I, I guess I'm interested in understanding, like, so so people talked about, I think it was Riverside County, like getting their um, 
their social work staff certified to do the uh, uh, social security applications, which is great. I guess I'm interested, is there a barrier to using care court funds for that purpose? Um, and would it help if we address that in some ways? Um, and then I think in San Francisco, you were talking about sort of the power of um, I don't know, I think I call them now peer peer support folks, which I think is a very powerful model of reaching out to people. And are you able to use care court funding for that kind of staff? Because it seems like there's there's been a lot of money available to counties, but you're not using it all because the numbers are fewer than you thought. So is there a way to sort of use the money as flexibly as possible to serve the clients that you have? Anyone who wants to respond, just jump in. Well, I, I'll, I'll I'll speak on behalf of the attorneys who may be too gracious to uh, respond on their own. They don't get enough money. I mean, the, the money, to the extent there is money, is going to public health. And the, what I think the model was set up with the understanding that the attorneys would be attorneys. They're not attorneys. They're doing all kinds of social work and outreach, and they're finding people, and they're not getting paid for any of that. So um, if the, if that's the way the model has to work, the attorneys have to get more of the money. Yeah. I, and and the other thing is our our board, you know, our CEO's office is saying, OK, you have four hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it costs two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year for an attorney. And we don't even know if you're going to be the care court respondent representation next year. So every year we don't know. So it was it took months and months for them to agree to give us a position. And now they're ready to take it back. You know, because, hey, we don't even know if next year and you wait, you don't have a full caseload for care court. Yes. I mean, if you consider that our other attorneys have 200 cases, it's outrageous. But also care court is only going to be as successful as the effort that's put into it. So if they gave me a client support specialist, not even a full social worker, just a peer support case navigator assigned to care court, which is certainly cheaper than an attorney, it would be a game changer. But right now we're grabbing them from their other duties. When behavioral health says we can't find someone, our client support team finds them on the street within an hour. It's yeah. amazing that what they can get done. But all that funding, all those positions went to behavioral health. So unless I, you know, the county, if you don't have that funding committed for two or three years, they're just not going to give us positions. Yeah, so I, I hear that part about like, is there opportunity for multi-year funding? So appreciate that. And then I guess if, you, if you're paying an attorney 220, 220,000, right? You have other money. Can that other money be used already for the, I'm trying to understand the difference between you need more. So I, I don't actually disagree with that, but is there a way to use the money that you have flexibly so that you can hire the, the positions you need or do so, they? We would have to have the funding to, so we'd have to have the justification. So the board would have to authorize us to have a position separate from the funding. So if they gave us $400,000 and I go ask for a position, our board says, sorry, there's no guarantee that you're gonna have funding for the next two years. That violates all of our policies. You can't have a position. So, I mean, I, I could, I as I understand it, take the excess money and put it towards the client support position who's working towards care mm. court, but that doesn't solve the problem. It's not that I need the, I, I need the extra position, right? Yeah, so you need, the, you need the position that's funded with care court and your county is unwilling to fund that position on like a temporary basis, right? Because it doesn't right. lose funding. I, so I, I think it's a kind of a multi-layer problem. But I guess, so it's, oh, I guess oh, Kate, ahead, Kate, and Kate had a comment, I think. Oh, I would just, I just wanted to kind of validate what you were saying, Catherine, that um, having more peer support folded into this is I think really important. And we've been able to foster relationships with the Mental Health Association, which was given money, I think from the state, maybe not from the state bar, but from the state generally to fill that role. Um, but to have someone on our staff, that would be, that would be great. I think the thing about my team that's been really great is that everyone on my team has some sort of lived experience and, and would to be able to define themselves as a peer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's been great for us, but I, I understand that not every person is going to meet that definition and, and we shouldn't expect them to. Um, and then another comment is just, uh, on behalf of Devin, 
Um, the QLSP attorneys do not get paid two hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. No, um, sorry, that's I, I actually, that's I not, actually assumed that, that since I don't yeah. know of any that do. So. That includes okay. benefits in the entire yeah, package. Yeah, yeah. We don't. I, I don't okay. make two hundred twenty thousand a year. <laughs> it, it just is the, the cost of the position total yeah. given everything. I, I think the difference though is public <laughs> defender versus legal aid lawyer. Where even if you added in the benefits, it's not going to be two hundred and twenty, most likely. So. Yeah, I was thinking a new retirement job. I have a question. I, I thought Devin made a very interesting point about uh, referring to other agencies. And I literally, when I was on the bench, had the referral forms for wraparound services, which I just fill out, fill out myself and send it off. Is there any reason uh, with the grant or with those jobs, you can't do what he's doing? And then when you have appropriate cases, you refer them to um those who provide wraparound services, immigration, whatever it may be. Is there any prohibition from doing that? Because, I mean, I used to do it. No one told me I couldn't. Just do it from the bench. Can I add to that? The um, Most of the wraparound services are provided by behavioral health in our county. And so um, when we are trying to craft a care agreement for a client or see what services they're entitled to, um, as public defenders, we have no idea what services are available. And so it's very much the rooster guarding the hen house over at behavioral health as to what our clients could have, uh, because we don't know. Um, one of the things that we did is we hired a social services provider from behavioral health, and she's been fantastic in telling us what our clients are entitled to, but not everyone's going to have that good fortune of having someone apply to a position that has that knowledge. We also have someone who came from APS, which is also giving us a unique perspective. But that's a huge problem that our offices are are finding is how do you how do you craft a care agreement for what behavioral health is supposed to provide when behavioral health is the one telling us what they can provide. What they can or cannot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. How about regional center? Are they involved? Could they be involved? We I don't haven't, the criteria. We haven't had anyone that Teachers qualifies for regional serve, center yet. Yeah, primary disability of psychosis is not going to be eligible for regional center. Yeah, I, I don't remember. It's been a while. So, Chris, you're patiently waiting there in the background. So, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add in uh, for context from staff. Um, everything everyone has said is uh, totally right. I think the. Um, for the the statutory like restrictions on how the for for 2023 for this state fiscal year how it was worded in the budget act was um uh the dollars could be used to for qlsps and public defender offices to uh support representation and care proceedings and matters related to care agreements and plans and so just for the committee to know uh, in consultation with the judicial council state bar staff has taken like a, a, a somewhat cautious approach to that. Um, so things that are definitely in are as like any work, even if it's work that a, a, a non-lawyer is doing at the public defender's office or the QSP to help find the client, as long as it's supporting like the attorney and the representation in some way, the outreach, that, that sort of like go out and help find them, um, uh, social worker type services to help engage them. But we do sometimes get questions just to flag it from public defender's offices and QLSPs, like, can we use our dollars on stuff where the, maybe the petition hasn't been filed yet, so they're not in care court yet, but like outreach type work. They have another issue that's not really related to their caregiving or plan, but it's a very important like life need that they have, you know, so that could be like a social security benefits or immigration status type question. Those sorts of things are cautious reading of the language in the care act of, is uh, not, we've advised them not to do that. Uh, um, uh, less they run afoul of that language. So um, just wanted to flag that that's, that's been something we've been figuring out over the last year. We work with the Judicial Council to kind of figure out what that means. Well, um, but that's about different. that. that. That's like really frustrating because we have this long mm -hmm. discussion in our committee about the importance of things like social security benefits so you could actually get housing and become eligible. So to hear, like we've now given advice, you can't assist somebody in a social security matter that really is kind of required for their success. Ultimately, that's like, honestly, I'm going to say I'm, I'm like disheartened and disappointed and that we didn't even know that because we had a very long discussion about exactly those issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I remember, Ms. Blakemore, 
I felt equally strong as, as you do, and they can't refer someone to a, a, an agency that handles Social Security appeals or something. I mean, that's I, I that's really no sense I, to me. Yeah, but we we discussed it and decided like the only example mm-hmm. given in the thing that you couldn't do was immigration. Although I heard somebody so good for you finding a way to do immigration issues, mm-hmm. but I, like. I, I guess for the committee to revisit is whatever guidance is being given because it feels honestly very different than the two lengthy meetings we had exactly on that topic last year. Allow me to clarify, Commissioner Blakemore. The, um, I, I, I fear I misled you just now, so now, that's my fault. So um, we haven't actually had QLSP say, can we use these dollars for social security benefits advocacy before the SSA? Like that's that is not, and we it, that hasn't been a question they posed, and you know we haven't advised them against it. When the QSPs and the public defender offices ask staff like, "What are the restrictions on the dollars?" What we tend to do is sort of we we re-deliver the language in the CARE Act itself and the Budget Act, and says, "Well, this is the statutory language. This is what's in your like, your your agreement with the State Bar of California. Um, you should be as careful as possible with these funds." So we haven't actually had any funding recipients this year ask for like a particular um, sort of what I would say, like others type of civil legal aid use for the dollars. And I think they've, I mean, the two QSPs can, can let us know if this is true for them. They've been spending it to our knowledge just on the actual advocacy for care court to make sure they don't accidentally run afoul of the statute. I think the only instance where we've, we've advised an office against doing something that they've explicitly proposed, and this was in consultation with the Judicial Council, was pre pre-care court petition outreach. So, so the, 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 um, no one has filed a petition yet, but the office, one office asked, can we go out in the community and maybe help find people who might be good candidates for care court and help them file petitions? And that was one where we, we looked at it for quite a long time and said, well, because the way it's worded, we think it needs to be like, the matter needs to exist in care court. Okay. So I'm sorry if I, if I misled you. Just well, now. thank you for the clarification, yeah. although I guess I want us to revisit it when we look at the RFP and be very clear that those ancillary things that support people being successful with their care agreement, in fact, are, are covered. Because what we all want is people to be successful so they don't have a, a different kind of proceeding that they're dealing with. And like it, it just seems like somehow that's now unclear again. So like... Can we, we can uh, when we get to the RFP, we'll we'll pull it up and see how it's worded and see if it uh, yeah. if it can be worded. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me go, Jody. You've been sitting there patiently, so yeah, sorry. Sorry for that. I'm curious as to what's happening with the respondents once a petition's been filed, um, and the respondents that don't meet the prima facie eligibility requirements. What's happening with them? Are they just being dropped? Are they still our services? Are they still being connected to services? And are you seeing that um, in our co- cohort one courts? Are we seeing some of the respondents that don't meet that eligibility requirement? Um, I can answer as to my experience. We had one person who did not meet criteria and did not wish to receive services, although she was referred and given um, the phone number to our county's what's called CARES line, which was the name of the line before CARE Act, so it was kind of convenient. It's like a, a no wrong door policy phone number that anyone can call and is supposed to be referred for county services for whatever services that they need. Um, we had another one dismissed because um, the person was not um, in the county. And then um, actually two, two were dismissed because someone was not in the county. And then um, a third was dismissed because uh, care would not be uh, the least restrictive. So um, everyone is provided with um, the information for additional services, but typically the people are resistant and don't don't want our assistance at that point. Um, And then while I have the floor, if I could just say that for people who, if we're referring them to another entity to do social security or something like that, this population is so hard to find that when we have them, we want to do whatever we can for them while we have them because we're not gonna see them again. And so to say here, we've set up an appointment with you with the social security advocacy agency, it's not really feasible that the person's gonna get there. 
We've mm -hmm. actually had people just say, come into our office. We're going to set an appointment so you can talk to Social Security and we're going to give you a landline that you can sit in this office and not have to worry about your cell phone power, your connection, whether or not you have access to those documents that you may need that they're asking you for. So, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Melanie, go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks. So I just wanted to add that in the self-help centers, um, again, we we're, weren't really <laughs> expecting everybody to come through the self-help centers, but gosh, here they are. So um, a lot, it's the families, it's the, you know, parents of the person, uh, the respondent and such who are, who are coming into the self-help centers. And the cohort one plus Kathleen over there in LA have really worked hard to make sure that they are the answer to if people don't qualify. So Kathleen's even got these in LA, she's got designated private spaces that have these uh, kiosks and they have uh, the part Department of Mental Health is actually co-located in the Norwalk courthouse, but they have remote access uh, from all, all the other 11 courthouses that have family law. And so the the kiosk can either enter the person into the courtroom button number one remotely. So whatever courthouse they walk into, they can appear in Norwalk without having to get on a bus all day or however they get there, get lost on the way or whatever. Um, but the important part is that button number two goes right to those Department of Mental Health folks. And they're using them you know, they're being able to connect them uh, when someone doesn't qualify. So wait, your your petition isn't going, you know, got rejected or you're not, you're looking at the criteria and it's not going to pass and you know it's not going to pass. Let's not stop here. Let's press button number two. I'm going to step out. You have a conversation with the mental health folks and let's see what other uh, services are available for for you and for your person. And one of the things that's coming up is sometimes with privacy, the person already is doing some other services, and so the petitioner walks out without very many answers. But their person is participating in some other program, and no one can tell that you know the parents or whatever because of HIPAA. But outside of that, they're even actually finding out that uh, these connections are, are helpful in family law cases and other case types. So it, it really is a, a fabulous opportunity to get people more help. And again, it's in our self-help centers that we're really able to do the work of making those connections. So I, I guess I'd like to ask a broad question to all the panelists or anyone who wants to respond. I mean, just big picture. I mean, are you hopeful? I mean, is this is this program moving the needle forward in any positive way? Um, so that's just a big question. And then just secondly, is there anything we can do as a, as a commission to, um, to help you to make this better? One thing that's come out of this is that maybe we may need to relook at our guidelines for, for funding, what you can do with the funds, but any other specifics would be helpful. <clears throat> um, Judge Record, sorry. I, I can speak for our experience of the Homeless Advocacy Project. I think we are hopeful. I think that we see this as something that could potentially benefit the folks that we're seeing. Um, for a lot of folks, this is the first time that they have eyes on them and they have people that are trying to help them. And I can think of a number of clients right now that's the first time they've gone to speak to somebody and they're just happy about that. Um, we're very much in the infancy and I think you know as Ms. Wilson has described issues that we're seeing in other folks in other counties um, there's definitely hurdles I think that we're trying to cross um, and there's definitely ways I think that we can grow I think we're all trying to wrap our minds around what that looks like certainly like Judge Beckert said we gather we talk we discuss either in San Francisco or as a whole um, I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say but um, I think we you know there's a level of approaching this with care. Um, like Ms. Wilson said, there's certain issues that we have to be aware of with our clientele, but on the whole at Happy, yeah, we're we're very hopeful for the future of this program. Thank you. Any other I guess yeah. Um I think we're we're Ellie's position is it's too soon to tell. Um we we don't know um how this is going to play out 
it, when or if SB 43 gets implemented in other counties. Um, I think for us, it's it's hard to say where this is going to go. Um, if it does end up just being a funnel to conservatorships, um, but we're hopeful that maybe that we can turn that around um, and we, we want it to succeed. It's a program that we believe in, but um, it's too soon for us to say where we think it's going to end up. I think the secondary mission of any public defender or any Q QLSP is probably eternally hopeful. That's how we operate every day. Um, otherwise we couldn't even come into work, but um, we are hopeful. We are seeing successes. Um, we are seeing people um, improve their lives. And so we are dedicated to continue on that mission. Um, the things that I would like the commission to consider is definitely some of the reporting requirements. You know, we can easily find out if someone's a veteran or not, but a lot of the legal outcomes that are being asked, um, that we're being asked to report on, we don't have that information. Um, like who they accessed housing resources. We don't know who behavioral health used for funding to access. And we can ask, but we're not guaranteed to find out unless we go to a court hearing and ask the court to order them to tell us. But, you know, that that kind of information is really more in the hands of behavioral health to report how they used the funds to um, benefit a client. Catherine, go ahead. So I think what I just have a this might be more of a state bar or judicial council question, but uh, you know around this sort of amount of funding that's available, what what happens on June thirtieth if those funds haven't been spent? Is there the opportunity if you didn't spend a hundred thousand dollars of of what you had? Does can that be rolled forward to a subsequent year as a way of over time increasing the amount of funding that's available for? Um, the people providing the legal assistance? Actually, Chris, you should probably answer this because we, we talked about this the other day. It's a great question. Uh, the State Bar is, and Judicial Council are looking into whether or not it might be possible for the public defender offices, QSP support centers, to be able to sort of carry forward their funds and continue to spend them on permissible work in the next fiscal year, like through a certain end date. But we would need uh, the Department of Finances like sign off on that, and and uh, we're still waiting to hear back. We're you know so we're like eagerly looking into that. But as of right now, the default is uh, if that's not allowed, uh, the state bar would have to invoice for any unspent funds as of July one. Like we would send that invoice over the summer, but then they would get new funds like in the fall for the twenty four twenty five fiscal year, and there could be like a cash flow gap. That we would do everything we could to like shrink, but it would just be, there's only so much we would be able to do. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Helen, could I ask you to see if you could quickly, I don't know whether this is possible uh, practically, but if you could, while we talk here, just find the list of the reporting things that they have to do, the list of reporting requirements or whatever. Sure. We're not gonna look for you. If you can find it quickly, maybe you can put it on the screen. If we can efficiently look at it, fine. If we can't, we'll do it later. But in the meantime, uh, yeah, we guys see a hand. So go ahead. I just want to say we are hopeful too, like like Devin and Jen. I mean, uh, eternally optimistic that this is going to help our clients and that this will be something good. Part of it is it. Everyone wants to know, you know, locally, is it working? What do you think? Is it working? And it's it's just takes time to <laughs> build trust and build relationships, and that's such a huge part of working with this population that it's just taking time. I think. But also, I want to say, if any of you leave this meeting thinking public defenders are overpaid, I have officially failed in my role as the Stanislaus <laughs> County public defender because that is outlandish. Um, but please do understand the way that board, you know, budgeting and positions work with the counties is they consider the entire cost of a very topped out attorney with every benefit. And if you don't have every penny of that funding, even if you're going to hire a level one, you're not getting the position. No, so. we get we get that. We know that you guys are in the top one percent of income earners. So yeah, right. Yeah. I wish I would have retired <laughs> long ago. I'm 25 years in. <laughs> um, other comments, questions? Helen, is that easily accessible, or is it going to be too complicated? It is easily accessible. Let me share my screen. 
but I don't want to cut off other discussions. So yeah. anybody chime in if you have other other questions. So I am curious. So we had uh, Jennifer. You talked about the number of cases and the number of agreements. Um, what about from? Is it Stanislaus? Are you from Stanislaus? Did I get that right? How many I'm cases from, do you, do you all Stanislaus. have? Yeah, I think it's very similar. I don't have the actual number, but I, I think it's similar to what what Jen said. I mean, it, it, they're in such different stages right now. A lot of the times, somebody says, "I don't want services," and instead of just dropping it. I mean, we give them time. We give our client support team time to go out, you know, build these relationships. So there are a lot of cases just in random phases, um, but we've had quite a good number of petitions and we have some success stories already, people doing very well. Mm -hmm. What about the QLSPs? How many, how many cases do you guys have and how many agreements do you have? Um, so you in know. San Francisco, I think we have 22, like Judge Beckard said, um, HAP owns 11 of those and we've reached uh, two care agreements. I think technically we actually still have just four cases that are um, ongoing. Is it correct in San Francisco, if I remember correctly, like there were proposals from the QLSP about each of you getting a certain amount of money to do this work. And then the remainder of the money went to the public defender's office. Is that right? And so I hear each of you might have 11 and there's 22 total. So what, what is the, what is the public defender doing in San Francisco? There's, there's still, there's, there is a couple of cases that the public defender's office has, but that the way the statute's structured, if there is a QLSP available, the court must appoint the QLSP. So the, the public defender is the, the safety net. Yeah, if yeah. there's no QLSP available. Uh, there are a couple of cases where I think everybody agreed that it was appropriate because the public defender was representing the client in some other kind of proceeding. So the public defender's office represents people in uh, LPS proceedings. So they're already familiar with somebody. So everyone might agree, okay, that one will go ahead and sub in uh, the public defender's office. Uh, my understanding and everybody here probably has a better understanding than I do, is it, this is based on your case count, right? You get a certain amount of money budgeted to you based on the number of cases that you have. Um, so uh, that that issue is um, built into uh, how the money is allocated. Yeah, that's, that's correct what Judge Beggart said. And then Eric, to answer your question, we don't Currently, we at LAE don't currently have any care agreements. We have one that's being negotiated, and then we had one that was being negotiated but is now caught up um, in the SB 43 debacle. So, And you had 11 cases? Did you have half the cases? Yeah, we had. I don't know if we had exactly 11, um, but yeah, 11, 10 to 12. Um, I don't have the data in front of me. Yeah. And so two, you have one agreement and then one you're working on? We have one agreement that's being negotiated and has not yet been signed. And then we had another case that had proceeded from the initial hearing and the hearing on the merits and um, is going to have an agreement, but um, is now being caught up in some another legal battle within care court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, all the counties in cohort one, adjusted for population have comparable um, petitioning rates. I think Stanislaus is a little higher. Hmm. Uh, I think the other thing that's very uh, very difficult to compare is that the counties are very different in a whole bunch of different ways. You know, yeah. how big is the county? Uh, how populous is the county? Uh, what, what does their conservator do in terms of when they will file an LPS visit, petition and when they won't? How robust is their AOT program? How many collaborative criminal diversion courts do they have? So, for example, in San Francisco, if you're in criminal court and you have a mental health issue, you're going to use the criminal court diversion court because um, because you're going to get a legal outcome guaranteed in that court. There's no reason for you to go to care court. You're, you're better off in that criminal um, criminal collaborative court. If you're in a county that doesn't have a drug court or a veterans court or a behavioral health court, uh, then you don't have that option. So it, 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 we're not talking, 
uh, apples to apples here. And the, the cohort one counties range, as you know, all the way from Glen County, you know, to uh, Orange County, San Diego County, and now um, LA is in uh, cohort 1.5, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 1.25. Yeah, 1.25. <laughs> um, did you, do oh, you no. have the, oh, sorry. Eric, I was going to say, uh, while we're pulling up the RFP to look at the reporting requirements, this might be a good time to look at the language around um, uh, what work the dollars can fund. And I, I um, we thought it might be helpful for, for us to invite our um, Office of General Counsel to also hop in. And so we're just trying to promote a member of that office, so they can weigh in too. Uh, it being a statutory interpretation. Uh, Shannon, would you mind could, could, promoting? Could I could I pipe in on one thing before? We, the, the, to me, the amount of money that you're getting per case, if you're um, doing this work, is mm -hmm. so low that the questions about how you spend that money are irrelevant. You're going to spend the money. <laughs> um, it, it's you don't have enough money to spend. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Hmm. So I don't know, Devin or Caitlin, it, you. I mean, we're going to spend the money. I think the the thing too that um, maybe this answers the question is that when it comes to the cases, they look inherently different than maybe other cases that you might have them in the sense that, like Caitlin described, like it is so time intensive, right? Like it's not just we're going into court and we're going to go talk about a care agreement. It's we're running around the city, we're looking for this person, we're out in the rain, you know, under an overpass, trying to get this person zoomed into court, like, there's so much other stuff that comes into it. So um, yeah, I to, to answer the question, I, I don't know if that's um, a comparable assessment. But yeah, like, I'm so not Chris, sure. um, we certainly should look at at the guidelines for spending. I don't know whether we need to do it with this group. Yeah. Uh, because I don't, I want to respect their time. Do do we need to have the the panelists, uh, the other for the visitors, look at this, or can we just discuss this as a committee? We can discuss it as a committee. I just, uh, Brady, can you? I don't know if you can hang out um, for a little yeah. bit longer. Well, I, I just, um, hi everybody. I'm Brady Dewar from the Office of General Counsel. Um, special welcome to um, um, Jenny. I'm um, I'm from Modesto myself, and know some people in your office. Anyhow, um, <laughs> uh, I just I just got pinged. Um, were um, somebody had the question were ancillary legal services permissible to be funded and it, it's sounding like from what I just heard this might be a purely theoretical question um, um, and I'm not sure what's meant by ancillary legal services but the the budget act is pretty clear that it's to provide legal counsel pursuant to subdivision c of the sections 5976 the welfare and institutions code for representation in character proceedings matters related to care agreements and care plans. Um, and then that uh, citation to Welfare and Institutions Code um, says that um, respondents shall be entitled to be represented by counsel at all stages of a proceeding commenced under this chapter. So it sounds like there needs to be a tie into the, you know, actual- I, yeah, I think we all agree that, that it needs to be tied yeah. in. We got down this rabbit hole with some examples that See, that the committee last year said were were relevant to the care court agreement and the person's success in that. And we had a long, I'm, I'm sure you might've been there, a long discussion twice about what that looked like. So I don't think we need to do it. I mean, I it seems like this group has some interest that people that are here on what the reporting requirements are. So maybe we should turn to that Chris and Eric and then yeah I, I agree uh, about the other so yeah Helen do, can you project that real quick and I don't want to keep people too sure. much more. we have probably other commitments and it sounds like the biggest concern is on the outcomes and how public defenders can collect the outcomes and I don't know whether that's a similar problem for QLSPs or might well be more used to the outcomes because they see it other places so can everybody see this screen? Yeah. Um, so this so is what, the, oh, go ahead, Helen. Great. Um, this is what we currently have in the um, draft RFP for committee's consideration for approval today. Um, as far as quarterly reports, um, I 
believe what was brought up was uh, 1A, client demographics such as race, race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, disability status, veteran status, limited English profici proficiency status, and housing status. But we can certainly um, revisit, uh, have a discussion about any of the um, criteria. So do our panelists looking at this want to comment on specific things that are problematic? I can say so far, we have not had an issue with 1A <laughs> when we have contact with a client, but certainly for a client which we've been appointed on um, and we're reporting even though we haven't met them because they've refused to come to court or we haven't found them, we are limited on that information. Do you have problems, uh, which I saw in my court, where people, you know, are psychotic, you ask them their age, they say they're uh, you know, 5,000 years old, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and the degenerate identities, and not the typical, you know, trans, et cetera, they, they just, you know, there's a guy who says he's pregnant kind of thing. Uh, are any running into those issues? How do you fill out the forms? Um, not yet. Um, and some of this information also comes from um, the yeah. petition as well. Yeah, uh, we're mostly it... gathering it from the petition, like uh, John was saying. Oh, we are too, and Judge Klein just kind of to your point, but in a different light. Um, it, what we're experiencing is that because of the diagnosis and the paranoia that's intrinsic to it, it's hard to get people to even like trust us to report. So we've had a couple of people who like, well, maybe we'll try to gather and it just doesn't make sense, especially when we're trying to build that preliminary relationship to even get them to trust us. So that's also an issue. Well, let me do I mean, if, if you try to gather this information and you can't, wouldn't you just say unknown? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, what? that's all you can do, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, is this it? Is this the list of things they have to report on? This is what the RFP um, articulates. What actually is presented to them when they log into the portal. So like this is like race, ethnicities and legal outcomes, but they actually get suggested like race, ethnicities, legal outcomes to, you know, say this number of clients identified as white or, you know, this number ended with this legal outcome. That's something that across grants, we, the, the staff pulls from the legal aid reporting handbook or we'll add things that are like relevant, it, we do it in, again, I say this a lot, but in consultation with the Judicial Council and others. Um, if, say, uh, Jennifer from Stanislaus or Jen Bender from Riverside, if you're thinking that the, the category is okay, like it's okay to ask about veterans status, for example, we wouldn't need to change the RFP, but if you're thinking like the actual options we're having to pick from, and we always give them an unknown or another option, we try not to hamstring them, um, if the actual options you're picking from, though, are are challenging, that's something staff could work with them and come back to the committee sort of with what our thinking is like, what are the the legal outcomes we should be asking about specifically, if not the ones that are that are like listed in the CARE Act. But that wouldn't require us to change the RFP. It, it would or would not. It wouldn't. Or, or uh, and I don't think it would based off how it's drafted right now. I think. Um, yeah, like D, which Helen has at the top of the screen, the way it's phrased now is legal resolutions, or sorry, I'm sorry, Helen, can you scroll up to the bottom of the next, yeah, C, legal outcomes. I think someone mentioned that's challenging. It's phrased legal outcomes that are relevant to the CARE Act, including care plans and agreements. So that's kind of flexible enough that we could, uh, staff could work with the cohort one in LA funding recipients to figure out like which categories within that um, are categories they can report on that are relevant. Okay. Usually the RFP doesn't though list like every possible legal outcome. The current list is is more or less copy and pasted from the CARE Act. Okay. Well, it sounds like we could, if we wanted to, we could uh, approve this, the RFP as presently stated, and then you guys could work with the population to modify the way that they actually have to report if to make it easier, I guess is what I think I'm hearing. 
Okay. Um, I get we're we're coming to okay. You can unless anybody else comment. Okay. So it looks like we're coming to the end of our time here. I want to thank all of you for coming. It's been very interesting. Appreciate your involvement. Um, and we will uh, let you get back to your day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and and uh, I think yeah, everyone took quite a bit of time away. I think uh, uh, Judge Berger, you may even had hearings this morning, and I, I, I maybe this isn't true, but I think you found someone to like cover for you so that you could be here. So yeah, we're from staff too. We're so appreciative. Yeah. All right. Sure. No. No. Uh, w w uh, I think you could all tell we could have a much longer yes. conversation about all of this. So yeah. thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we, um, let's just, let's just move on here in the interest of time. So the next item on the agenda is the uh, consideration and uh, hopefully approval of the RFP. So let's see, Helen, are you going to take us through that? I am. We do have um, item 4.2 um, update on the 2023-2024 care court funds, which should only take a few minutes. All right. See if you can do it. Give us the executive summary. I will. Let me share my screen. All right. Let me know if uh, you can see my screen. And yeah. Great. Um, this is item 4.2. Um, so we really Did brief. you want us to see your screen because we can't see your screen. Oh. I, let's see. Okay. Hopefully that's better. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Right. All right. Um, this is item 4.2, an update on the 2023-2024 care court funds. Um, at the committee's committee's request um, at the last meeting, um, staff uh, requested that grantees and funding recipients providing legal representation to report the number of new cases prior to this meeting. Now we um, some of the our guest speakers also um uh, shared some of their numbers um, just a little while ago, but this table shows the number of open cases to date separated by quarter. The total number of cases has increased slightly from first to second quarter, and the total number of cases to date is 349. Um, Los Angeles County has the highest number of new cases from quarter two and total overall, followed by San Diego County, um, and then Glen County also saw its first case in quarter two. The numbers were slightly inconsistent with what we just heard, but they're close. Like San Francisco, they all said 22. You're saying 24. Maybe they got a couple in April. I don't know. I they might. Grantees do um, have until April 15th to finalize and submit their quarterly reports. So they may have had one or two pop up um, within the last week since they uh, we asked them to report these numbers earlier this week. I mean, and it's not an insignificant growth, I think, right? I mean, the mm, yeah, right? like I, I, I don't think it's small. I think like what I would have expected is kind of this continuing trajectory as the program becomes known, as people like right, and it's it's not insignificant to have. I mean, because it's not cumulative, right? Those are the new cases open January to March, which is not an insignificant increase, right? So yes, these are the new cases. Yeah, yeah, good point. <clears throat> um, this is the only slide for this um, agenda item. So if there are no more questions, we can move on to 4.3. Um, well, I mean, it is interesting. I, I appreciate Catherine's point there about the somewhat seemingly dramatic growth here. And if that trajectory continues, this this may be I mean, look at Los Angeles, for example, right? 27 to 82, that's... Yeah, well, <clears throat> interesting. Um, well, unless there's other comments, let's... If, are there? I mean, otherwise, let's move on to the to the RFP. Do we have any update? I'm sorry, I, mean, if, if I didn't really see any. Like, it seems like we don't yet have an update about the funding level. And what's happening with that? Is there any information to share about that? We do have an update. Um, I included that in item 4.3. Um, I can certainly. It's okay. It's, I, I'm happy to wait. I just. 
if it's okay to move on to the next item. Yes, it is, sure. Um, we're moving on to item 4.3 to approve the 24-25 care court grants request for proposals. Um, I will start with brief background. As a reminder, on March 29th, 2024, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission delegated authority to the committee mm -hmm. to approve an RFP um, for the 2024-2025 care court grants and to recommend awards. Um, the full resolution is on the slide, um, so I, I won't read it word for word, but just a reminder, as you all are aware. Um, this slide is a bit of a refresher from the last meeting. The Budget Act of 2024 will provide funding for QLS QLSP, Public Defender Offices, Support Centers, and other entity services starting July 1st, 2024. Um, as we've mentioned, the Budget Act might pass in mid to late June, which will provide the final amount of funding. Um, staff recommends releasing an RFP this spring to allow the commission to, to determine the 2024-2025 awards and funding for the public defender offices um, by or soon after June 30th. Um, this staff recommends at this time that the RFP cite the governor's January 2024 proposal of funding of 51.7 million. Um, that is the same number that um, we shared at the at our prior meeting um, with example RFP. Um, like we've been saying, the Budget Act might provide less funding since data about the relevant funding needs um, is still emerging. Um, the 51.7 million number um, in consultation um, and in our discussions with the Department of Finance, um, they have uh, recommended that we continue using that number. Um, staff also recommends that the RFP base the process to distribute the 2024-2025 funds on last year's proce process. Um, table one shows the 2024-2025 care court grant timeline. Um, I don't have, I won't get too granular with it, but I will highlight a few key dates. Um, today, should the committee concur with staff's proposal, the RFP will be approved and released tomorrow. Applications would be due on May 10th, um, and scoring will begin. The committee would recommend awards to the full commission on June 7th, and the commission would approve awards on June 21st. Um, this timeline would, would allow um, the commission to, to determine funding awards um, shortly after um, or by June 30th. So it looks like <clears throat> to the extent that commissioners will be involved in scoring, we're looking at the latter part of May. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Subject to the Budget Act, the RFP would restrict eligibility for a 2024-2025 care court grant to QLSPs, support centers, and other entities that have relevant experience. For QLSPs, funding would be to provide legal counsel for represent representation in care act proceedings, matters related to care agreements and care plans. Um, the section that is in quotes is directly from the statute. For support centers and other entities, funding would be to provide training, support, and coordination. Um, again, the section that is in quotes is directly from the statute. Um, any funding not awarded to QSPs to serve a county would go to its public defender's office instead, and any funding not awarded to this work for this work would go um, to representing clients. Um, these requirements have not changed from last year. Last spring, the governor proposed about 51.7 million to support this work in 2024-2025. The RFP provides a preliminary estimate of 47,564,000 million, 47 million for KLSP and public defender offices to represent respondents and up to 2 million and 68,000 for support centers and other entities to provide legal training and technical assistance. Um, up to that same number, 2 million, and 68,000 will be, um, is also estimated to cover administrative costs. Um, as we've mentioned, the Budget Act might provide less funding. Uh, data about the funding needs is still emerging. Um, for reference, in the uh, agenda packet today, Appendix A of the RFP also estimates the funding for support centers and other entities at the 75%, 50%, and 25% of the governor's January proposal, and that's mostly for reference in case that 57 uh, 51.7 number changes um, in mid to late June, perhaps. 
I do. Um, I'm so sorry, Helen, if you had said this, but for, um, for I think, because that was the update for um, the answer to Catherine's question. So I will flag that we did, staff did ask a couple of different agencies, including the Department of Finance, if this was still, like this was after the committee met in March, if this was still kind of like a safe number to put in the RFP and they did sign off on it. Um, we did, we did investigate, like, should we, should we discount it a little bit to manage expectations and sort of the compromise approach was to just provide the other table. I think Catherine, you might've even been the one to suggest this in March, but somebody suggested it. Everyone liked the idea of including a couple of tables that would just show like what the funding would be by County with smaller amounts, but, but there was support for using the governor's January proposal, which is this one on the screen in the RFP itself. Yeah, I, I guess I ask in part, so I appreciate the data. So I think I was the one that said, what would it look like if there were reductions? And I, I don't know if you want me to comment now. I mean, when, when you look at those tables, the table C actually, I think, might be inaccurate because there's some counties that are below 60,000. They're like at 57 and there's two of them, I think, that ended up being a little wonky. But my concern with like, so what we've done, we decided that 60,000 was the threshold for these small quote rural counties, right? But when you start applying that threshold and just run the formula, what you're doing is taking counties that are no longer particularly small or rural, and now they're gonna get 60,000. And um, some of them have populations exceeding 200,000, whereas the initial counties were all sub 70,000. And as someone who lives in one of those counties that's affected, like it, there, there is a difference in size between 20,000 and 70,000 people and what you might expect is the workload and the capacity to do that at 60. So I actually think there has to be some adjustment and recognition that 60,000 is fine if the county is, let's say, below 100,000. But either one or two tiers above that that recognize like you, you're not going to be able to do this for 60,000 and instead have an additional tier or two that says that if, if we're doing these reductions, you need to then adjust upward from the 60,000 in some amount so that counties aren't left trying to do this with, with very little money. Because now uh, under this, I think it's 50, I, I I spent more time than I would care to admit last night looking up the population numbers for all the counties yeah. end up at 60,000. Um, and I think it's like 54% of the counties in California end up at like by the 25% level end up in that group. And like, I get this is affecting everybody if those numbers came to be, but um, I, I like, I, I, I don't think that universal like everybody just gets reduced to 60,000 works given the difference in population and this is if the number comes in Catherine a lot under what the governor proposed right this is like if we're looking at 25 this, percent or 50 percent it starts happening at 50 percent at 50 percent yeah. and it is more impactful at at um at clearly at 25%, but there, there are emerging trends already at, at, um, at the $50,000 $50, level. And so to me, it's like part, like if we're gonna say this is what it is, I think we have to be mindful of that universal approach. We're just gonna cut people and there's gonna be a floor of 60,000. Yeah. doesn't appreciate the differences well does does the allocation work <clears throat> if if we get what the governor is recommending Wait, i'm not i'm not speaking so we get what the governor but it attached to the rfp are these examples of what happens so we're sort of saying if if the funding is reduced by 75 50 percent 25 percent here's what those allocations would look like so counties would yep. kind of know what they're going to get. And there's lots of other unknowns. We don't know when the counties are starting. Are they going to get their full allocation if they start mid-year? I mean, there's, I think, lots of things up in the air. But sending out information that says, essentially, the commission has decided if funding is reduced 50%, here's the allocation. Or 
if funding is um, reduced by 75%, it's only 25%, here's what this looks like. It, it has this impact that I don't think we contemplated when we set that initial $60,000 um, threshold limit because the counties that are impacted become like <laughs> there's they're like one of them is like the 40 like it's like it's a pretty populous county right for for California you have the very large counties and then you start you have sort of this middle tier yeah, yeah. no I, I understand your point what I'm trying to understand though is whether we need to bake that contingency into the RFP well, we, we shouldn't put out the contingency that says all these counties are only getting $60,000 because I don't, I I at least don't, I mean, you, you all can say you think that's fine, but that's essentially what we're saying because we're including these tables in the RFP. Well, what I mean, could, Part we, of the attachment. could we frame the RFP in a way that gives us flexibility to alter the distribution if the actual funding turns out to be significantly less than what the governor is recommending? Without uh, I'll, I'll just weigh in on that. You, you can, the committee can frame the RFP to allow it to, I, it's, it's already contemplated that the, the committee would need to sort of finalize the funding amount after the budget act. You know, that like once we get more information about how much funding is actually available, it would be preferable to kind of like decide up front what the formula is uh, to, for informational certainty for the people reading the RFP, but it would be allowed to kind of revisit it if it looks like the allocations aren't gonna work for a reason like the ones that Catherine just described. It is a matter of just sort of wordsmithing the RFP to make it clear that the committee like will kind of reserves the right to just ch change the funding floor to to make sure that counties get enough funding or something like well, that. Well, now that we're talking about that, where would we do that in the RFP if we wanted to do it? I think you'd have to put it at the somehow at the beginning of all the tables to say these are I mean, yeah. so to be clear, the tables are examples of yeah. running the current formula as it is, maybe we say the commission hasn't approved those funding levels. Let's say we're, these are examples. These are examples only to show you what happens if the funding formula it is. The commission has not yet approved a final for funding level if it is based on, uh, uh, if, if the amount is less than what's in the January budget. So to be clear, they're examples. That's great framing. And I think, um, Helen, do you do you mind actually toggling back and forth between your slides and the RFP? I'm just going to flag where I think where that could go. I mean, we, we would we could say something like that um, above the tables themselves, but I think there's a, a page in the RFP. It's distributing funds by county where it describes mm -hmm. the funding floor where we would want to make that note. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to fix both Butte and YOLO, I think. Because Butte currently shows at 25% that it's 57,000, so it's below. And YOLO, I think, is in the, I'm not sure, but yeah, and YOLO is also at 57,000. So I think both of those have to be raised up to 60,000, which is then going to require an adjustment of some other county. And I didn't, I mean, I was doing this at, because I was, anyway, I was doing it very late last night, so I can't tell you those are the only ones, but those are the two that I quickly found. Were you a math major in college or something? I was the opposite of a math major, but <laughs> I have come to really love and appreciate numbers. <laughs> well, could, 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 let, let's get the, let me, if we can toggle to the RFP, I think we might as well look at this while we're talking about it. <clears throat> let me Thank you, Helen. Toggle over. Okay. So it probably just goes on page five. A total estimate would yield the following allocations below. The Budget Act might provide less funding. And then it says, for reference, Appendix A estimates allocations. Um, but I think, I mean, I would be clear, like these are like examples and the commission has not yet mm. determined the final funding levels. Um, and, you know, will do so once it knows the final budget amount or something. So I think it's at the, at least on my printed version, it's page page five, right above table one. <clears throat> yes, right here. 
Yep, that's what I was thinking too. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. Um, is this a doc? Is this a PDF or is this a document that we can kind of modify on the fly here? This, this is a doc. This is a PDF. But um, I would suggest that when we get to the slide that has the resolution, that because because Catherine, I like the way you worded it, and that actually sounds quite succinct. I think we can actually type that into the slide. You know, it's like one of those like edits that's like you yeah. can, like you can almost do it in a sentence. Okay, that's fine. All right, Catherine. Yeah. Remember, remember what you just. I'm gonna did. write it out because I yeah, never I wrote it. I was writing it down too. Yeah. Um, I will flag that. Yeah, this is the this is a good page for it. If you scroll up one page, Helen, we might want to say something in yeah. step two as well. Mm -hmm. Um, or something just about the good. funding for it. Yeah. Can I take a look at the fifty percent table I, that we were kind of just talking about to see what we're what we mean? <clears throat> must, must uh, okay. be on the page. Oh, I see. So that's the one where a lot of counties, even fairly large ones or large-ish, would end up getting sixty. <clears throat> I mean, it's some happens at fifty percent, and some happens, and far more happen at. Um, seventy five percent. So I don't know if you let me see. Like, so it's not like, for example, El Dorado County is not impacted till twenty five percent, but there's mm -hmm. still, you know, like everybody has a pretty significant reduction. So El Dorado County at twenty five percent drops down to sixty. I think. Mm -hmm. Can you scroll down just a little bit here? Let me just see here. Um, when in oh in you. So it's hard because they're not all lined up. So you have to go back and forth between the three tables to say who was originally in right. and then who was added. And then I couldn't, I was going to try and put it on one table to send a Chris, mm. but I couldn't do that because it was a PDF. So mm. I, mm -hmm. not possible. Are you saying Marin? Well, here Marin gets a hundred. Marin, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know which table we're even on anymore. Is we're on the 50% table. 50%. Okay. Yeah, uh, so the, the tables are meant to be, uh, Catherine, um, as, as you said already, the um, examples. So we'll just make that very clear. But I do think the, uh, like you suggested, the text of the RFP itself, like uh, above the appendix, should should be really explicit that I mean, it's it needs to be more explicit because these are estimates, and that the the committee will finalize funding amounts after it learns what the total funding is, and and will um uh and may need to like adjust the floor to ensure like you know however we want to word it. All right. And then I I would really just encourage that those math errors on table twenty five get adjusted because it just makes yes sense. yes I wrote that yes. down to you. Um, uh, yeah, we'll have to recheck the, we had a separate spreadsheet that ran the formula for the, the 75, 15, 25. So we'll have our fiscal team check that again. Thank you for catching that. Yeah. Okay. Helen, you want to move on? Sure. Let me change my screen. Um, we actually just talked about this a little, so I'll uh, just yeah, go through this briefly. Um, it sounds like we will add language to step two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next two slides sh show the estimated allocations for each county with a $60,000 funding floor. Um, this is really just meant to be a visual um, and reference. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for the scoring rubric, um, for consistency, the RFP uses the same scoring rubric as last year. A successful proposal will describe the applicant's ability and qualifications and organizational capacity to provide services as stipulated in the CARE Act. Um, I do want to note that we made one technical update on the RFP to reflect an update in the language of the statute. Severe mental illness has been updated to serious mental disorder as part of the CARE Act eligibility criteria. So just to follow up, there was a bill it, when their character originally passed, it, it said 
uh, that respondents had to be someone currently experiencing a severe mental illness, and then it defined it, severe mental illness. And then as there was a bill, SB 35, that passed in the fall that changed the phrase severe mental illness to serious mental disorder, but kept the definition the same. It just changed the, you know, when you look up, it's like the same definition of who qualifies as a respondent in that respect. So we would update the materials to have that, that new language. But um, Helen, when we posted the RFP, did it say for today's meeting, severe mental illness or serious mental disorder? A severe mental illness. So, that, so, that so we, not... would, we would ask that we'd be able to make that, that like, it's like a quote change, like that the, the CARE Act now uses the phrase serious mental disorder. We would make that change throughout, wherever on the application that appear, you know, severe mental illness was used in the RFP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, this is the scoring rubric. The four categories for evaluation are impact, qualifications, administration, and evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, the RFP specifies that a complete application include five main components, a project profile, a project description, a project budget, budget narratives and project assurances. These components are in line with the state bar's other grants. Um, I know that we uh, mm -hmm. went over the reporting requirement. Uh, a few of our guest speakers also spoke to the reporting requirements. Um, just as a briefer, the, to help compare data between funding periods, the 2024-2025 care card grants RFP uses the same reporting reporting requirements as 23-24. This framework is based on the equal access program reporting. Um, in the instance that staff receives guidance from the Department of Finance, uh, Judicial Council of California, and other agencies, um, staff will revise reporting as necessary. It was interesting that Stanislaus doesn't know how to connect, collect data. Um, so can I jump in on this slide, Helen? Sure. I was thinking since you showed the RFP and, and the way it was the reporting requirements were phrased seemed, um, uh, I mean, we might want to take another look at it and just see if there isn't like a word we want to tweak or something. Uh, but I was thinking like, okay, well, we don't, um, like maybe it says like must re must collect this and and we change the, you know, the, the, the word to be something like, uh, and it may include this and then that would, or something so that staff could go out to the cohort one funding recipients in LA between now and the committee's next meeting in June and and do more, um, uh, get, get more of their opinions about, like survey like the whole group, uh, about like what reporting categories are challenging and, and the like, and then also circle up with the judicial council because they oversee our work on the reporting, but then come back to the committee in June with like, if we think there needs to be an edit to the reporting requirements. That would, that's how I would, that, that's what I would pitch it looked to me like the way it's phrased in the RFP is like kind of high level. Um, you know, we don't list, I mean, it might just be a matter of maybe changing it to like, we anticipate that the reporting requirements will be or something like that. Well, the reporting re requirements are what they are. I mean, um, I mean, could we say like to the extent feasible or something that they must collect to the extent reasonably practical or feasible or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we do, I will say, we do always give them the option of um, reporting, like, unknown. But, it, you know, they if we say, like, you need to collect veteran status or something, they'll, they'll always, like, try to ask for it. So. Well, is, is unknown one of the options? It is. It is, yeah. Okay. Well, for almost every category. Okay, well, yeah. doesn't seem that difficult to check that if they can't get the data. I don't know. I think we can leave it as it is. Okay. Um, I will move on to the resolution and I can also uh, in so real time. We, I'm sorry, were we gonna discuss the, like, is there anything we need to do differently with the language about what are the allowed services, which was the other subject that I thought Eric kind of put for our committee discussion, not with the others, so. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think we we did want to circle back to that, Helen, before we do the resolution. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, we, I'm sorry, would you mind toggling back to the Yes. Okay. Let me... <laughs> we can look at how it's actually yeah. Share that screen. So, 
So this might be yeah, just above the table. Ramp parameters. Oh, it's perfect. So we left this language the same with one exception that was kind of like a, a technical edit we made throughout, which was just to reflect that the Budget Act of 2024 hasn't passed yet. So uh, in last year's RFP, this is, this is paragraph number two, the way it was worded is very similar to here. So the grants are not the fund. We didn't, we didn't change this part. Uh, wraparound services or supports, for example, housing, as in like the housing itself, that become part of the respondents' care agreements or plans. So that's the same. Uh, and then uh, in the RFP for last year, it said additionally, um, lobbying, it didn't have the comma, the, the, the comma phrase. It just said additionally, lobbying and legal services unrelated or dot, 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 fall outside the scope. So for the RFP, because the Budget Act of 2024 hasn't passed yet, it's phrased additionally for the current fiscal year, lobbying and legal services unrelated dot, 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 fell outside the scope. So it's kind of saying like, you know, heads up, this might continue to be true in the next fiscal year as well. But this was this is what the committee, yeah, uh, you know, kind of the we talked about for a long time. How do we adjust so that the interpretation of this is clearer? Because it it feels to me like even though we might have agreed to the language, we don't actually agree about what it means. Yeah, I can say because I've conferred with. Um, well, we heard from Brady this morning, or uh, and I, he might be able to hop back in if you like him to. And I was conferring with with Dwan. Um, it is the state bar's position, just to be explicit, and this is this is like staff's advice to the committee, that to go back to the example, work like public benefits advocacy before the Social Security Administration, even if like helpful to a care court respondent, is very likely to to be unrelated to the care agreement or plan, unless it's like part of the care agreement or plan. But and I know that was just like an example. The we individual cause... needs housing and they need a way to pay for housing, right? So the county doesn't have enough housing and the county's not going to pay for housing. So one of those strategies you use to get people money to pay for their housing is to get them their social security benefits reinstated. It's really common that for homeless people, they were previously on social security and then they lost their benefits because they didn't respond to a variety of letters because they didn't even know they got them. And now they need those social security funds to purchase the housing. Why is that outside of the care agreement when it says you need, you know, like we're, you, you gotta have housing. We're not paying for the housing. We're helping people get the funds to get the housing. That's required by the care agreement. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that might be a situation where it would be related. I guess I was thinking more like um, it, uh, it, the, the example that I just gave, I was thinking like, oh, they, they fly. Oh, this person has another issue we've spotted. We'd like to help them with it. Can we use our care dollars instead of like our IELTA dollars or something? So the way you described it, I think actually would be something we'd want to look closely at. Well, um, I think it's eligible, like, right? I like it, it just, I, anyway, I'll let Lauren speak. She can be more articulate than I am. I don't know about that. Um, I just wanted to say, I've said it um, several times before, but bears repeating that when this statutory language was drafted in consultation with the governor's office and the Department of Finance, the intention was to include these ancillary services. And that's why it says related to care plans. Like that's why that phrase was added to expand it beyond just representation in care court. Um, that was why the governor's office originally wanted legal aid to be involved because legal aid does those ancillary services. That was the intention. Um, so I just want to make sure that that is said again. And I wanted to remind everyone of that. And then secondly, I just think that it's apparent from the conversation we're having here now, it's just confusing. Like when QLSPs were trying to decide whether to apply for this money, it's very unclear what they can and cannot do. And I think we're even having trouble articulating it here now. So if there's any way to make it more clear for folks, I think that's going to make a difference because right now, just like parroting the statutory language back at organizations leaves them asking, okay, but so what can I do? What, where's the line? Well, yeah, I mean, what may be confusing is that what we're spelling out in item two is what they can't do. Um, maybe we could be clearer about 
what the QLSPs can do, <laughs> you know, what, what it means to maybe to provide an example of, of a service that's related to a care plan that would be permissible. Well, and to use in some ways Lauren's language with examples, I think you may use these funds to provide ancillary services that will allow the implementation of the care plan, right? Yeah. That's, that's what you can do. And I would then give examples of, of what that is. You may need support to be able to live in your house and helping someone get IHSS, which actually provides the support. You're not going to, the legal aid program isn't going to pay for the supportive services, but you want someone who can help with medication administration, you can get that from IHSS. And that's an ancillary service because you will not be able to implement your care court agreement if you don't have access to the medication. I think, um, Eric, we, we do still have Brady, and I think Brady might have to step away in a couple of minutes. So I just want to, I see you just hand yeah, up. I just want to back. Brady, jump in. Yeah, uh, so, and, and I'm uh, newer to this um, than any any anybody. And um, uh, so as I read it, there there needs to be a tie-in. And, and the, the way I would think of it is, like, does the care court say, does the care court agreement spell out, oh, you need to secure housing, you need to do this, you need to do X? If so, then it would be a matter related to your agreement to, to do those things. I don't think it can be read so broadly as, I mean, anything that improves a, a, a person's life, a client's life is obviously going to help them be successful, right? So I think it needs to be tied into something that the care court agreement is saying must be done. Well, I think, so I think the challenge, Brady, so I don't, I don't disagree with the nexus at all, but the care court is agreement isn't going to say you need X, Y, and Z to maintain your housing. It, it's just, they're not that specific and we're okay. not going to get judges to issue orders that say like, say something that specific, right? So it, it's in some ways like the ancillary services needed to, per, you know, to allow you to, to successfully implement your or carry out your care court agreement is really what we're talking about. And I think at some point we have to trust that the QLSPs know what those services are and that those services are extraordinarily valuable to people and Providing them will allow us to show that this program has greater success than than it otherwise would. And I, you know, I, 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 I think maybe one one thing that would make sense is to say, you know, if you're doing wraparound services, you know, briefly explain how this how this supports the care agreement. Um, like you say, we 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 trust them because it is it is broad language, and I, I think that there are a, a, a range of interpretations that that we would be allowed to make. Um, we are given as a regulatory authority some deference here. So I just think that because it says related to care agreements, either we need to define what that means or at least say, hey, you need to you need, you need you need to check the box that you know you've determined that this 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 is required for the Success successfully completing the care agreement. That in fact, it is a matter related to a care agreement. It's an ancillary service. This is an ancillary service related to the care agreement. Right? That's. Yeah, I'm just, what I'm wondering about is whether, uh, and I think this is a very important subject um, and it would be useful to develop more specificity around examples of services or that would be permissible. I don't know if we're going to be able to efficiently do that today. Is that something that could be done by, let's say we were to approve this RFP, would staff be able to work on a set of guidelines to make available to QLSPs or potential QL, you know, bidders, whatever, to provide a little more clarity uh, in connection with the issuance of the RFP? Yes. Yeah. For and one sure. other one other point I'd raised is just uh, before I have to jump off. I'm sorry. Is I think that the you don't want this part of the 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 language to you know swallow the intent such that you know 
oh, we've got this care court client. We're going to be providing them all the services and all the disputes they have using this care court agreement when in reality, maybe some of those should be IOLTA funds. You know, we don't want people, to, our QSPs to not be able to take their, take new care court clients because they're giving such great comprehensive wraparound service using care court funds for other clients. I mean, I, that's I just sort of want to like be the clear too, Brady, Brady, like, I think the clarity here is we are not directly funding the wraparound service, which is what number two says. And we had a long discussion, right? The wraparound is the actual housing. We're, we're not going to be paying for the housing. Right. Could we help people secure the housing? Yes, right? Because the care court agreement says you, 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 you're, you're supposed to have a house, a place. I mean, whatever residential living option you're in, right? And so it's the ancillary mm -hmm. services that are needed to as assist the person in, in like in in being able to implement their care their care plan yeah can i ask a uh, an example about housing um Catherine, i don't actually have an opinion about this but i'm curious what your what your sense might be so if, if a respondent is for example um i know they they're often already unhoused but sometimes they're sometimes they're tenants so if they're going through an eviction and part of the care, their participation in care court is looking at their housing. It's very likely housing will become part of their care plan agreement down the road. But their eviction is like to next week, their eviction proceeding, like might they be able to use their care court representation dollars to represent them in housing court to- I, I guess, but, but under that, that's your, like, you're not yet in the care court. You don't yet have a petition. So- Well, if it was like post-petition, if they were like a respondent, like they've been appointed as- Respondents counsel. Yeah. So I, I don't actually have an opinion about that, but I was just like to give another example that would be like, you could they be like, wait, you know, we're representing you in care court, you have an eviction next week, your care plan and agreement conversations are going to be happening after that. We've, we want to like try and help you with this because obviously housing is like, like the judge said, it's housing first, but I could see that actually coming up. But, but I guess you just said there isn't a care plan yet. So if this is ancillary to the care plan, like having to answer the own question to me, there's a difference of you're supposed to you're, you're in care court and your care plan. Everyone's agreed you need to maintain your housing. And now you're being evicted because your behavior related to your disability resulted in you punching holes in the wall and the landlord wants to evict you. That like representing somebody in that circumstance when they have a care plan and they're told they have to maintain their housing. That seems like an example of an ancillary service. I, I didn't just, yeah, I don't know. I, just I, I, I guess because, because I feel like the bar's already answered the timing question. You, you've said if you, if you're, you're not in the, I mean, I don't know, like you don't have a care plan. It's supposed to be related to the care agreement and the care plan. Like it's ancillary to that, but Lauren may have a different view. Um, no, I mean, I agree with you. My question was just, it, could we just change the RFP kind of in line with what Brady had raised to say something along the lines of that, that you can provide whatever service related to the care plan so long as you are willing to certify that there's a nexus to the care plan and yeah. leave it at that and as long as an organization is willing to say, yes, there's a nexus here. I don't we... think from it's a statutory... Provided you can indicate that there's a nexus to the care agreement or the care plan. Rather than trying to define... Yeah, it, the, the existence of it, and, that, and that's, that's predicated on the existence of a care agreement or care plan, like, has been formed, like... Not right. a future one, but like one exists. Right. Well, okay. this is like a care, matters related to care agreements and care plans mean yeah. those exist, right? Those and exist, yeah, yeah. So it's like not part of the negotiation process like that leads up to one, but yeah. That, um, that does sound like something, I was, I was just trying to marry like a suggestion Eric made about, um, approving the RFP with something kind of like this, but then coming up with some technical assistance and guidance that could go with it. 
um, versus how we would incorporate that change into this. I, I like the idea of maybe wordsmithing this a little bit to get at that. Um, does somebody have, um, Catherine, like what, how you would suggest changing Okay, the second I, sentence I did just finish two. the last language that I'm going to email you. So what is it <laughs> going to do now? Like, oh, in the current to fiscal year. This? I would just say, um, like, sir, I don't know. I Lauren said it, I think, really. Like, it's services related to care agreements and care plans when the QS when the provider shows that there's an excess, right? Then I can't really copy anything. I don't have anything open or I like play around with the language. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you this other thing that you need for the other part. Uh, and thank you for doing that, by the way. The, um, well, so uh, and what we can do for the resolution is we can we can also go back and check the recording and and and. Well, I mean, I think also, like, why don't we approve it with the understanding it's going to be amended and I'm happy to work with you or consult with Lauren about what the final language looks like. Yeah. You mean what the technical guidance would look like? I think we're just talking now about, at least for the moment, trying to be a little bit clearer in the... And the RFP. I do like, Eric, the idea of doing some guidance, like, independent of the RFP, too. Yeah, like, like more long-form guidance. Um, um, yeah, but, but for, yeah, just the, yeah. So I think yes and yes, uh, for the RFP, I would, um, I would say since we have 15 minutes left and it's our last item, I, I would say like, let's see if we can't try to come up with the language now with the whole committee here, rather than, than like staff and Catherine and, and Lauren, like circle up afterwards, um, just for, so the whole committee can, you know, for transparency's sake, um, I think we're close. Um, so additionally, for the current fiscal year, lobbying and legal services. What's, can, you just, can you just start with which number are you on? Oh, number two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Helly, can you highlight it? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so this is how, yeah, how it's worded. Uh, no, no, but I think we want to like say something proactively, not have it. Yeah. Like in fall within the app when you can't do those things. So it needs to be. Can we add, maybe just add a sentence to the I, end it, of it? I really in set, no, it should be in one. Number one, yeah. Number two is what you can't do. And now what we're trying to articulate is what you can do to Eric's point. And so it says matters related to the care agreements and care plan when the, whoever these are, the legal services providers, right, sh demonstrate a nexus to the care plan and care agreement. Yeah. I think that sounds good. Yeah, I I will have yeah. I don't have any. I'm not the decision maker here, but it just is my my advice to the committee. I, I don't have any objections to that. Other committee members said where you where would you put that? Where in number one? I would probably squeeze it in between the second to last sentence and the last sentence. So like before the support center piece. I agree. My only question about that suggestion is if we're saying demonstrate, how about that implies I that it's it's hard. Like, how do you do that? that? Yeah, I get, yeah, it's just a question of whether the organization. Can I, can I suggest? I'm I'm sorry, I don't know if somebody said certify, uh, which is fine, but can I suggest that uh, maybe the RFP just needs to say there must be a nexus? Like, um, yeah, I, I worry if we put in like they will have to certify okay. that I that requires some kind of like official like form. A great or idea. Right. Yeah. yeah. But they just they just must be a nexus, and then how they demonstrate it or certify it is we can kind of figure that out later. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so yeah, so there must be a nexus. Uh, to a care agreement or care plan. Is it the beginning of that sentence? Was it um, other? I don't know if you want to use the word ancillary or not. I don't. Again, I have a strong opinion, but like other civil legal services may qualify provided that there is a if for for care for court respondents provided that there is a nexus to the care agreement or plan that sounds good to me yep um 
I'm just making notes so we can do it and add this in. One moment. Maybe Helen, you could also take this note just so that we can compare notes. Yeah, but. And so the resolution, Eric, uh, we'll probably have to say something like, as discussed at today's meeting or something, unless you want to write it in. Do you want me to read what I just sent you and Helen, or do how do you want to do the other change too? Oh yeah, that'd be great. Well, in a moment we'll pull up the, the resolution and then I, maybe I will ask you to read it. Do, out do you want to just, get, can, do we have some language for this change though? We do. What Chris just said. Let me, um, uh, I think it's safe now, Helen, to actually go back the to resolution. the slides and let's go into edit mode. Helen, you're doing a great job of going back and forth. But yeah, okay. not easy. <laughs> Thanks. Great. And uh, let's let's go ahead and go to the resolution. There we go. And I think because we do have just under 10 minutes left, we might actually be able to just type it out, which would be ideal. Um, uh, as described in steps, um, go ahead and do uh, uh, with the follow. So at the very end, um, change the period to a comma. This is my suggestion, by the way, committee members, please, you know, feel free to words with this with the following changes, colon. Yeah. And then I would do a bullet point list. I think there's only two, right? Yeah. Uh, and I don't think there are the the resolution necessarily needs to say exactly where it'll go because we did put in our notes where exactly this will slot this in, but the um, the RFP will specify. This is just my suggestion about how we word it. That other civil legal services, and please do wordsmith this, everyone. Uh, uh, for care corp respondents, uh, may qualify. I think this is what we said. Provided, provided uh, there is a net. There must be a nexus to the respondent's care agreement or plan. And then I. We can words with that, but then I do colon and and then the the um the other one that Catherine kindly drafted for us. Okay. Do you want me to read it or you want to just cut and paste it into there? It's in an email that you both have. I'm pulling up my email now. Thank you, Helen. So Chris, while we're cutting and pasting, do we need the word may? Why don't we just oh, say um... qualifies if there is a, if there is a nexus? The, the only reason, um, I think either is fine. Uh, we were using words, I defer to the committee, we were using words like May for the RFP because the Budget Act hadn't passed yet. But um, like in, in other examples, we were like, it may allow for this or that. Lobbying may fall outside of the scope. But I think either is fine. Right, but we're not, we're saying this. No matter what the Budget Act controls. So, so I, yeah. I agree with Eric. We're qualify provided there is a nexus to so it's just to say qualify provided there is a nexus yes to respond its care agreement and plan or plan is there a difference between a care agreement or a plan yeah, yeah they're 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 slightly different a care but agreement I mean, is kind of like a negotiated like a settlement between the respondent and the <laughs> county behavior health agency and a care plan is court ordered Care plan doesn't it, i don't remember in the earlier one but they're both called care agreement or care plan i think oh but yeah put, you put care in front of both yeah yeah respondent so okay but then above it should say qual take out the word may Qualify provided there is, is a take out must be and say is a nexus. Thank you for the good suggestions, Eric. And then the second one is what I was attempting to do is attachment A shows the impact of reduction in the funding is. Well, we don't need if there are reductions in the funding or if the funding is reduced, there's too many reduced in that, but 
the impact, I think I would take if reductions, just say the impact if funding is reduced. These tables are examples only. The commission will approve fi final funding levels following the final budget numbers. As part of approval, the, condition, the commission will consider if adjustments to the funding floor are needed for counties of different population size. Uh, the commission will approve, not will approval. Yes, sir. Thank you. Following part of... Um, I think you can take out as part of approval, you can just say the commission will consider, yeah. right? I don't think you need it again. It's very hard to like multitask. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay. Um, commission will consider if adjustments to the funding floor are needed. For counties. That's great. And then the last one is like, honestly, I don't even know if we really need it, but uh, since we're doing this anyway, um, can we just throw in that references to severe mental illness, quote unquote, will sure will change to serious mental disorder i know it's like so like pro forma yeah. but it's fine unless anyone thinks it's substantive it will just will have included it serious mental disorder mm -hmm. all right and then that and then that tracks changes in the care act well done may i make a motion to approve the resolution i will so move second uh <clears throat> So I, I think um, I heard uh, Commissioner Blakemore move first. Okay, and Eric, then... I said I would move and Eric did and then Vanetta seconded. So I'm happy to give it to Eric and Vanetta. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so uh, uh, Eric moves and Vanetta seconds. And I'll take the vote. Uh, Commissioner Blakemore. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Campbell. Yes. Commissioner Escobedo. Absent. Uh, Commissioner Morales. Yes. Judge Klein. Yes. Commissioner Pryor. Yes. And Commissioner Iskin. Yes. Um, Eric, that's uh, six yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions. So the motion passes. Great. Good work, everybody. That's great. Good Thank meeting. You. Right on time. Thank you very much, um, Catherine, for writing the language for the second bullet point. Yes. Agreed. Thank you. And thanks to everybody. It's a good meeting. Thanks to you and Helen for arranging the panel. That was that was Yeah, the panel was great. I loved it. Oh, okay. does anybody I'm glad the judge could come. I got to go. Bye. Yeah. Okay, okay, bye Catherine. Bye-bye everybody. Goodbye. Have a good afternoon everyone. Bye everybody. Thank you. Take care.